I am so excited to be here. Uh, you are in for a huge treat. Um, these two men are extraordinary, and my hope this afternoon is to toss a few questions their way and then honestly to get out of the way and just um, have this wisdom unfold because they are really remarkable, each in their own right. So I, so first of all, both thank you very much for joining us. Um, I thought where I would start, just because I know a little bit about your backgrounds and they're so extraordinary and rich, I wonder if you might talk a bit about your backgrounds and what brought you to this moment on this stage where we're talking about ethics and character development. Me first. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Don. Uh, great to be here. Um, I discovered at a very young age that um, I had a huge curiosity about wanting to um, have an experience, a unity experience. And um, I grew up Catholic. I went to a Catholic um, boys' school. And when we were 16, I um, uh, was first introduced to Hinduism and Buddhism and then landed up studying it in um, university and found my way back into Christian mysticism. So I don't espouse any one particular tradition. Um, I'm enormously curious about what everybody else does in order to um, essentially go through a process of transformation. And one of the things I like to say is um, this whole notion of, um, of discovering who you are um, and you know, all the people that are out there that are supposed to help us uh, with who we are, the way it actually ultimately manifests itself is uh, in service of others. But you have to start somewhere. And, um, and so the speakers that I've listened to today here, for example, are perfect examples of uh, people that have made that commitment. So I'm tremendously curious to hear what other people are doing. And um, I have a few things that, um, now that I'm retired, that I have the great benefit uh, through my, the success that we had at BlackBerry, although you wouldn't know it <laughs> these days if you're <laughs> reading the newspaper. Right. Uh, of course, I retired two years ago, so... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, so, yeah. Um, in any case, um, I'm, I'm here simply because I have uh, great compassion for others and I have a great curiosity uh, for what other people are doing um, to um, get themselves right and then, uh, in doing so, make this world a better planet. And I had the great privilege a few years ago of meeting uh, Tenzin, my dear friend, who I felt was one of the leaders in this area. So how's that for a segue? Beautiful. <laughs> um, well, uh, delighted to be here and, and um, uh, pleasure of meeting you all. I, I made a non-rational decision at a very early age. Uh, not rational, not irrational, non-rational. Uh, I was 10 years old. I uh, ran away from home. Uh, and ended up at a Buddhist monastery, never left. Um, and uh, then uh, successively, I, uh, I spent two years with uh, Mother Teresa in Calcutta and had the privilege of uh, studying with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And then came to West to do secular studies and encountered uh, various kinds of challenges uh, with uh, secular studies and maintaining a contemplative life. And then somehow found my way to MIT, and uh, I think it was because I, was, I had this aversion to education early on, so I've spent all my <laughs> life to ed at educational institutions. Um, and uh, why am I here is uh, because of this uh, wonderful opportunity for conversation, and when uh, Don and Pat make an offer, you can't refuse. So here we are. Thank you, Tenson. Hmm. So I'm going to actually follow up with a question for you specifically. Could you talk a little bit more about the founding of the center and uh, the aspirations behind that? Um, well, to put it mildly, I, it, uh, it started off with a nightmare. Uh, it, it was a simple nightmare. Uh, I had been in, uh, teaching at MIT since uh, 2001. And in uh, 2007, uh, after having been through various educational institutions, uh, I came to the recognition that uh, the people were not increasingly religious or, or spiritual even in that right. Uh, so religious, religious institutions were becoming somewhat obsolete. And nonetheless, uh, you see, the, the avenue that religious organizations did offer for discourse or discussion around values or ethics uh, were, were not there anymore. 
the system of uh, elderlies uh, in the family as uh, through generation transmitting notion of values and ethics uh, that was breaking down because family systems are breaking down uh, high schools primary schools they don't teach ethics in college unless you're a philosophy major uh, you don't get to take a boring ethics class uh, or if you are an MBA you take an ethics course under the notion of compliance which is not really very helpful uh, <laughs> But nonetheless, there's an expectation on behalf of society that, that people are going to be ethical, that people are good. And so the nightmare was that that was the biggest gamble uh, that we as a world were involved in, and we are, we are all players in it. And in 2008, that nightmare somewhat became true with the collapse of uh, uh, various financial institutions and so on. And that sort of uh, led me to start certain experimental programs, uh, firstly with Sloan. And, uh, and then we formalized uh, with the help of uh, my mentor and uh, five other Nobel Peace laureates to found the Center for Ethics. Brilliant. Hmm. Uh, some of the work that I'm doing at Hope Lab, which is supported by uh, Pam and Piero Midiar, who many of you know, uh, involves some of the work that Tenzin is doing as well. And we're extremely interested in the cultivation of ethical leadership and of character development. And we're extremely interested in a very practical matter, how these things become actionable in the real world. The term values-based leadership to me is a tricky one because mm. I actually believe all leadership is values-based. The question is, what are the values that are in play? Um, <laughs> yes. And so I'm curious on your experience now back with a, with a, in, a, in a management capacity, when you were thinking about cultivating uh, ethical leadership or ethical engagement in business, yes, how did you do that? How did you approach that? Uh, well, um, I think the first thing is, you know, and I'll say this with all humility, um, you have to walk the talk. Mm -hmm. um, that having been said, um, in my business career, um, I had the great privilege of being at University of Virginia in 1988 at something they called the Executive Program. And uh, I met a gentleman there by the name of Alec Horneman, who became a friend of mine. He taught leadership, personal growth, and, and ethics. And um, my wife, Debbie, came down and joined us in the sixth week. And she went through the same program that I went through. It was sort of a sanity check for me. And <clears throat> so um, very much like Google here, we, you know, RIM in its glory days were full of very bright young people. And um, you know, I was encouraging them to be uh, attentive to certain principles. One of the things that we talk about a lot, so I'll do this as a caveat, is not to be too prescriptive on this subject because ethics in and of itself is not a precise science. Uh, but that having been said, um, uh, uh, Alec had four principles. And so, and I've done this with, you know, I've, I've given talks to the PGA uh, Association and uh, insurance Brokers Association, that sort of thing, and I and I talk about integrity, and and so, and the four principles that Alec espoused were: tell the truth, keep promises, fairness as a form of justice, and respect for individuals. And one of the little things I like to do, which I do rhetorically, is to ask people, uh, when is it okay to lie? Mm. So, and, and you know, there's always some smart Alec and. The front of the group will say, you know, when you come home at three o'clock in the morning, blah blah blah, right? Uh, but um, you know, how, and so how do you how do you answer that question? The answer is uh, in the form of a story, right? And um, the the story is a picture that you're living in Amsterdam in the '40s, and the Gestapo comes to the front door and asks you whether or not you're harboring any Jewish people in your in your home. Is it okay to lie? The answer is yes. And so what are the conditions there? Well, the conditions there are the threat to human life. Um, there aren't a lot of other instances where it's OK. And um, you know, we're, I'm from Toronto. Debbie and I, we lived in the States twice and overseas in Europe. We cross borders quite a bit. One of the things that people do when they cross borders is they like to see what they can get away with when they're crossing the border. Mm. So um, just to finish up on this, um, <laughs> Debbie and I did an examination of conscience and actually um, found ourselves wanting on this topic. Because right? you were carrying illegal contraband it was across a game. the borders? Yes, absolutely, and, uh, and, and got away with it. And, my, and the expression I use is when you do these little things, and even in the ordinary course of business day to day, you might say things because you're, you might be a little bit afraid of the recourse, or mm -hmm. so, so you won't, and that's one of the things that Tenzin talks a lot about is uh, in ethics is to have courage. 
Um, so it's, it's what happens when nobody's looking, and it also is not through these monumental things, but the ordinary events of the day. And um, um, it, it's a good test for yourself. And um, so it, that it, even in and of itself, I think, is a monumental step forward. Um, so that's probably a place to stop. Can you, Don, just elaborate on a bit. So in, in a practical context, you're a leader, yeah. you're in a workplace, you're working or mentoring uh, yeah. younger people. Yeah. How do you reinforce this this point in uh, in the sort of everyday magic of work life to make it come to life? Okay. Well, you know when so every every business has a rhythm. Um, most often in business, you come together in business meetings, right? And um, you know, if one of the principles is respect for individuals, I find quite often when people sit in business meetings, they're waiting to assert a position. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with asserting a position. Uh, I asked somebody uh, recently what they thought wisdom meant, and they actually said that they thought it actually meant that you're a good listener. Mm -hmm. And um, so these are, you know, these are not new ideas. But the point is to practice them in the ordinary event so you show respect for others uh, rather than being in a meeting where everything is just a collection of tangential conversations where people are trying to assert a position, is to follow. And if you are the one who's leading the meeting, you have the obligation at the front end to tell people at the beginning what success looks like at the end. Mm -hmm. And then to and then you set that boundary, then you, uh, you've earned the right then to assert, uh, for example, uh, when people have... Um, They've gone off on an ego tangent, so mm -hmm. to speak, right? So, I mean, this is just um, a tiny little example. Um, can, one, I, can I ask you, just related to this? Yeah. It's so, it's so helpful in, in, the, in practice. Yeah. So, in order to display respect, you're in a meeting. One of your colleagues has gone off on a tangent yes. where potentially mm -hmm. they are not showing respect. Yes. How do you bring them back to center respectfully? Well, um, first of all, thank you for saying that, Pat. Um, Notwithstanding what you might read about um, Apple and, and Steve Jobs or the, the, the way people used to behave in leadership at RIM, uh, there actually is no place for anger in um, business. Mm. It's a very important point. Mm. Um, you can be far more effective by telling people you're disappointed mm. than you can by feeling the need to demonstrate through some kind of emotive exercise. Now, it's not to say that I thought the slide that was up about fear was a good one. Um, so I think people have to move with a certain sense of urgency, but I don't think that fear uses or anger uses a control mechanism uh, has a long-term benefit for any for any organization. So it's not about um, embarrassing the other individual. Uh, I think it's about reminding people when they're in the meeting uh, just exactly why you're there. So you you find a gentle way, and um, you know I find it's most effective to be asking questions rather than necessarily being uh, directive, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is Tenzin's whole approach to the way in which he teaches ethics. So I, I want to ask about that. And I, as you spoke, I just want to remind you of something you said in a phone call we had that was beautiful, this, oh, this cultivation of bringing people home to their best selves. Yes. And even in the way you described that, I could imagine that's that you're inviting people back to, to yes. their better selves in the conversation. Well, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, but um, I don't think that having a, a view that people are fundamentally sinners is necessarily helpful anymore. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think this exercise, and I think mindfulness is a beautiful process for doing this, is it's actually an exercise of, of surrender and letting go. It's not about accumulating new knowledge. It's about discovering this essence and this energy, which is our own perfection. And then having made that experienced discovery, you're in a better position to engage with others. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Tenzin, can you talk a bit? So you've got these. He has just come from India, by the way. I, I, I want to acknowledge that because it's, I both love that you're here and, and only imagine what time zones you're operating in. Um, it's all a dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Can you talk a bit about, you, you, you work with these young MBA students at MIT. Uh, what's the process by which you, you move them into an ethical stance or more ethical engagement with the world? Well, uh, uh, first thing is uh, uh, the, the center is 
programs are not designed to be prescriptive. I, I, what I discovered increasingly was that this traditional method of uh, uh, prescriptive way of lecturing about ethics and values was actually not that helpful uh, in the long run. Uh, so one thing about MIT is I got to experiment firstly with the brightest minds. Mm. Uh, so my first session, uh, I still remember, uh, uh, half the class was uh, individuals who had like successful startups, had sold four companies, ten companies, and then come back to get an MBA. And uh, I'm teaching there with my colleague. And part of our teaching method is very reflective, which is we, we pose certain kinds of questions to them. <laughs> Uh, to show their methods of thinking or incongruency or congruency of, of things. And, uh, you know, first 30 minutes, there was no response. All, all, I, all I said was blank stares. And so I asked my colleague, who, who, who was a professor at MIT, and I, uh, I said, uh, uh, do you think this is making sense to them? And he said, I'm not sure. I don't register anything. <laughs> then, <laughs> half an hour later, you, you see this whole set of activities uh, that, that, that starts in, in the classroom around value discussion and, and what it means to be a leader. Because that was the other thing. I didn't want to just teach a course on ethics. Uh, I really wanted to make ethics relevant, and so it was regarding business leadership. Uh, at the end of the day, one of the most unlikely individuals in the class, one of these individuals who had sold many companies and was there and had very, uh, very uh, fixed opinions about certain things, the biggest compliment uh, after that was that uh, he mentioned to the dean of Sloan that uh, no, MBA should, no MBA should leave Sloan without taking this uh, course. Mm. Uh, and that actually, more than me, it actually strengthened the courage of uh, uh, my co-teacher. Uh -huh. uh, and now we have ran that program um, in several Ivy League schools and, and schools of management. And the center's program is in six different countries. We just launched uh, one in Abu Dhabi as well. Uh, so one of the things with that is we are looking at actually different demographics as to how people are responding to this sort of ethics training or ethical leadership ideas. Could you share, there's a great vignette you told me um, about when you were thinking about uh, founding the center and you were talking to students who had been through some of the tradi more traditional ethics courses where whistleblowing was taught. Oh, yes. Can you talk about that, <laughs> that uh, experience? So one of the things that, that of course, happened after uh, the financial meltdown was uh, there were all kinds of articles in newspapers questioning the entire enterprise of leadership. Uh, most of them were actually telling that schools of management or business schools should simply shut down because they were useless. Um, and if not, they should at least be humble and basically claim, in all, in all honesty, that they are simply training middle or high level managers that you should not take you know, uh, this, this idea that you are, you are actually training global leaders. So, uh, so a lot of business schools responded. Well, not responded really. They reacted to that. Uh, and, and everybody then started to come up with various kinds of leadership programs, including our wonderful neighbors uh, next to MIT and, and uh, <laughs> other, other, other universities as well. And, and you know, it, it's remarkable the, ki the kinds of criteria they came up with. So, so one school, of course, decided to do pledge and oath at, at graduation, which I think is a terrible thing to do. Uh, but why, uh, why do you think it's a terrible thing to do? Because they don't have any training to take pledge. It's, it's peer pressure. I mean, if, if you do a survey of all the uh, groups in the United States from age 16 and up that take oaths and pledge to do anything, from virginity pledge to other things, Everybody feels miserably, including ethics. <laughs> so, so, so I, I don't know why they went that route. But the other fashionable thing was to do case studies. So they did case studies of Enron and BP on, on ethical behavior. So I asked a couple of students, and I said, what did you learn in the class? They said, well, we learned that you should never become a whistleblower in corporate America. Otherwise, you'll never find a job. <laughs> so I actually had to ask, you know, what was the program? Well, the program was on ethics. I say, but that wasn't the desirable outcome. I say. Yeah. So, so that, that's what, that is what I mean by, by this prescriptive sense and doing certain kinds of case studies may not actually lead to desirable outcome of training ethical leaders. Hmm. I thank you. I love that vignette. Um, Don, who are your role models? When you think about yeah. great leaders and great ethical leaders, who are your role models? Well, you know, um, I think, um, thank you very much, Pat. Um, I think business gets a bad rap, right? Um, 
And, um, and I'll say this not just because I'm a Canadian visiting the States, because I don't have to say this, but I'll say this. Um, I worked for AT&T for 10 years um, here in the States. I was actually a lobbyist, if you can believe it, in Washington for two years. And then we were overseas for four years. And I, the people that I think about when I reflect on my career of about 35-odd years uh, were actually the guys at AT&T. And, um, and they had a great balanced life. But, um, and this wasn't a smarmy thing either. They were tough uh, business people. And um, you know, I think one of the ingredients, uh, which again is part of Tencent's program, is you first of all you have to be competent, right? I mean, and 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 so there's there's a huge issue around whether or not the person that you're working for you trust them, mm -hmm. and and you're willing to give them your trust if, first and foremost, you think that they are good at what they're doing. The second thing is whether or not that person's got your best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. I've also had the great privilege; I've been fired twice at at very senior levels, very public in the press, right? Um, not the rim job, by the way, by the way. It was uh, uh, two previous assignments. So I know what it's like to be out on the street uh, without a title and, and just walking around. <laughs> um, but uh, these business leaders, um, they, they had these attributes around um, the soft skills, right? So beyond the hard skills, there was a soft skills thing around um, they, they just made you proud hmm. of the company. One of the things that I was greatly uh, respectful of at AT&T was AT&T actually had a foundation. And the leaders of the company encouraged people to uh, participate in their company. This is why for me today, you know, I've been retired for a couple of years now, to come to Google, I'm so grateful for those of you there in the audience that are Google people, um, just to witness your culture and what you encourage. This hmm. is... This is a place um, where it's loosely tethered, and you're encouraged to manifest your own creativity. And, um, and so I'm just seeing it today, just even walking in here. I mean, there's, there's certain things here which uh, are encouraging and refreshing for me. But, so I'm not going to name names. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I could pick the usual ones like Kennedy and Gandhi and Martin Luther King and that sort of thing and, and espouse on that. But it was these attributes of these ordinary people who, um, quite frankly, I wanted to be just like them mm. and, um, and then set about to, uh, to do the best I could. How did that affect your private life? Oh, gosh. Um, well, uh, that's a heck of a question. Um, <laughs> Because one of the things I talk about is we actually are one person, right? Um, I never saw a division. I mean, I see people that put on a mantle when they're in business that's different when, than, than when they're in their private lives. And um, um, so I actually try the best I can not to have any separation in my behavior. Uh, it means that I greet everybody regardless of, I don't know if you know Rudyard Kipling's poem, but you can walk with King's but never lose the common touch. Mm. And so, um, you know, in terms of my family, um, they paid a great price for my success because, I mean, we were overseas when the wall came down, Kuwait went to war, and AT&T put them back up in 36 hours, and I was there with the oil fires burning, and the Soviet Union broke up, and we were in the 15 republics putting in these earth stations and what have you. So they didn't see me very much. Um, so, you know, this is... And, and what I say to people is um, everything's a situation. You all have to decide what your work-life balance is. But, um, you know, it's all very well and good for us to talk about ethics and everything. But when you're young, you have an obligation by virtue of whether you're a, a husband or a wife or a partner and you have children, you've got to be a provider. And there will be later moments in your life when you can begin to pick up on um, more comparatively altruistic things. What you can do now, which is beautiful with this sort of movement that's growing with mindfulness, as you can attend to yourself, mm -hmm. and as we saw from the last speaker, it can take nothing more than a minute and a half a day to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's super important. That's why I'm so encouraged and excited with what's actually going on today and how I think it can actually transform the fabric and essence of the way business is conducted. Because the way it's been conducted up to now, 
you know, as Tenzin was just saying, is uh, they've got it all wrong. And we did, there's not enough stuff to go around with 7 billion people <laughs> on this planet. So. Uh, he's, he's a contemplative through and through. I don't know how, how he made it this far in the business world. <laughs> <laughs> a closet contemplative. Yeah. Yeah. Tenzin, an, another vignette you shared with me that I think is just such a, a brilliant description. You talk a bit about, in, the, in your use of inquiry, you invite these uh, young leaders to describe what they believe the characteristics oh, are yes, of leadership yes, yes, yes. And, and the cultural differences you see. Could you, would you talk about that? Well, we, I mean, I like to do experiments. That's part of my physics training. So, uh, and I like to use human subjects. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so w one of the experiments uh, that, that we were doing, uh, part of this didactic process is uh, that when people I mean, everybody wants to be a successful business leader, at least in the, in the business school context. So we ask them, well, what are the qualities of, of a successful business leader? And we, we give them as much time as they want. You know, we, 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 prod, we give them names and everything. And they list the usual suspects, you know, uh, you know vision, persuasion, uh, money, this and that, uh, good speaker and all that. Mm -hmm. And during the first couple of times, it, it took an average of hour and 15 to hour and 17 minutes for them to come up with qualities such as honesty and integrity as part of the package of, of a successful business leader. So when I observed the phenomenon, I said, let's try it in another school. So we tried it in three Ivy League business schools. And it, take, it took between hour and 17 to hour and 25 minutes to come up with that thing. And when you actually t made people aware of that, that and, and the, Mind you, this is right after the financial meltdown, when the press is talking about honesty and integrity. When we actually made them aware of the fact that you know you listed all these wonderful qualities of, of a successful business leader and honesty and integrity, it took you so long. They would get upset. They would get defensive. They will start to rationalize. And, and that's a clear sign, this idea that you, know, you can believe you're a good human being, but that's not sufficient mm. because you can have all these goodness tucked away somewhere in the brain that, that you're not exercising on, on a regular basis. On the other hand, uh, when we ran the program in Asia with some other kinds of uh, groups, you know, first things that came up was integrity and honesty you know, as, as signs of things. So one of the things that, that the center is doing is, is uh, exchange programs between MBA students here and students over there so that they could actually try to understand what these shared values are. So um, there's and, and another Mexico, piece. Mexico beat the record. Is that right? An hour and 38 minutes. <laughs> so there's another piece of this story that's also marvelous, which is um, Tenzin talks about the, the, uh, the gifts and the competencies that come up with these cultural distinctions. And uh, when you are then actually talking to the students in the West about creating business plans and who your customer, your target customer would be versus those uh, in the yeah, I mean, talk about that too? Uh, one of the things that I was... Uh, uh, trying to experiment is, uh, with is uh, trying to teach some of these leadership, uh, leadership skills among the Tibetan community. And I'll tell you, well, who are your beneficiaries? And their response would be all sentient beings. <laughs> I said, that's not achievable. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, because because we, were do we were actually trying to deploy projects. And, and it took us almost 48 hours to, to get rid of this idea of all sentient beings for them to, <laughs> be able to actually think that they could assign you know, a couple of groups. Whereas here, you know, you ask them who the beneficiaries are of the project, and they'll give you the exact demographic. So. <laughs> Takes us a long time to get to honesty, but we know who the market is. <laughs> right. huh? Fabulous. I think. Where's my time card? Ten minutes. Oh, perfect. So we have some time for questions. If folks have questions, I have others, but I want to make sure I leave some time. If any of you have questions for them, any questions? If I may respond to one thing, uh, Pat. Yes. Ab about the. Uh, uh, what Don so wonderfully put about the uh, leaders uh, or role models uh, ideas is that, uh, I mean, you know, we think of role models as inspirational figures. And we think about becoming those kinds of role models. We all have, we, we are all role models, whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. to somebody in our life. Uh, so the idea is, you know, it, it's best that you own up to it. You take the responsibility of becoming the best role models you are. But when you're t thinking about becoming a leader, have an aspiration. Have an aspiration in the sense that, actually, when I think of leader, I think of Francis of Assisi. Not because he's a saint. Not because he's, he's a monk or, or, or anything. But not only the kind of inspiration he provided during his lifetime, but the fact that he continues to provide inspiration 800 years after he has passed away. Mm -hmm. 
That's leadership. Mm-hmm. When you're gone, when you're dead, in the grave, and you still consider you're still inspiring people, 30 million visitors to ACC every year. 30 million. Not all Christians, not all Catholics. Mm. 30 million visitors. If you can do that, then you have succeeded in making good leaders. Mm. <laughs> Beautiful. There is a hand. Yes. Yeah. Go into a little bit of detail on that. Sure. That okay, uh, very good. So the question was, well, what happens uh, when you find out that somebody hasn't necessarily um, behaved in an ethical way? Um, so I'll, uh, I'll tell you a super quick story. In 1997, um, when I, I was um, running the Consumer and Small Business Division for Bell Canada, and um, I, I gave up the Small Business Division, and somebody else came in and took it over, and as you find in large companies, um, there's a lot of politics that goes on. Um, and you know, power sort of trades hands very capriciously. But there's always an undercurrent that's going on, which isn't necessarily constructive. My definition of politics is when individual, self-enlightened expectations of individuals actually takes precedence over um, the collective goals of an organization. And in this particular instance, this gentleman um, was um, uh, saying disparaging things about me. And um, at the best of times, I'm introverted and, um, and, and not necessarily inclined to want to uh, stand up to people, particularly when they're, I just find ways to, to exit, right? Uh, but in this particular instance, I thought, well, this isn't actually good for the organization and it's certainly not good for me. Uh, so um, uh, I confronted him. And I said, um, you know, this, and so and he backed off completely and said, no, this isn't true. And I never heard about it again. So that's one example. Another example is um, um, I was giving advice to the gentleman who's currently the CEO right now. I had a hand in hiring him at RIM when he came in in 2007. And before he was named CEO, he was having all sorts of problems with politics, with others. I mean, it was prior to his appointment. And um, he said, um, I need your advice on how to deal with Jim Bosley and Mike Lazaridis and the board of directors. And I've got this other guy who's a peer of mine who's, who tends to be saying disparaging things about me. In that particular instance, I said, the best thing that you can do, Thorsten, is to be very good at what you do and not play the game. Don't go out in public and try to out-politicize. I say there are forces at work in this organization at the board level and at the sea level that are so far beyond your understanding. The best thing you can do is that when somebody comes to you and wants to know more about the business, that you're the go-to person. And of course, not to say that my advice necessarily had anything to do with um, his appointment, but I, it, I'm contrasting these to make my statement, and that is that everything is a situation, and you have to be guided by your own set of values and your own set of principles. In the one case, I chose confrontation, and the second, I advised on um, really doing nothing. Um, and, you know, you, 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 it's not an absolute science, but I, in any case, um, you do the best you can. And um, having an intolerance for it and the best thing I've already said, which is you walk the talk. And people will come up to you and say to you, uh, I was watching you when. You say, oh, well, that wasn't a particularly spectacular moment of mine. <laughs> but they, right? And But did you see? And so it's, it's getting true to yourself. And there's this mindfulness thing is so good because it really does root you in discovering who you really are. And, um, and that is, among other things, ethical. And I, as I say, it's discovering your own perfection. Mm. Thank you, Don. Yes, at the microphone. Um, this has recurred since this morning. And I think both you gentlemen would have something interesting to say about it. If you think about the ecology of the society, societal ecology, and, you, and, and the role companies play in that, Right? It's not just about customers, and it's not just about shareholders, but there are all these other constituencies. 
Uh, one of the things that comes up in basic economics texts is goods and services. I'm going to add essential goods and services to that, and thereby earning a profit to be viable to continue to provide those services. But what I've noticed in both practice and also in teaching is the tendency for the goods and services to get lopped off and the profit making to be the only thing discussed. And I think that's consistent with some of what you were talking about. Could either of you talk about this notion of broadening in the sense of Sangha, collective society, broadening the role of the corporation back to thinking about not just a customer, not just a shareholder, but the other constituencies, whether that be environmental, social, human rights, labor, you know. I open it because it'll get right back to the financial crisis issue, right? So please. I think, you know, it, it's fundamentally, again, the issue of an individual. If you're able to transform individuals from this, this notion of greed, deceit, and other kinds of negativities that drive uh, oftentimes uh, decision-making process, I think uh, we'll be able to mitigate um, uh, some of these issues. But, but the other thing is I think globally we have started to, as stakeholders, we have started to uh, think of different notions of return on investment. Uh, you know, and, and, and the bottom line is, again, as individuals, when, you know, if I have stake in a certain company and they're doing something that is illegal, like, you know, or, or, or careless, like what happened in Bangladesh recently, for example. But when shareholders are simply satisfied and quietened by the idea of the profit margin, that's irresponsible. That's not irresponsible of company. That's irresponsible of shareholders. Mm. So the responsibility of company at that point, I think, is to broaden this notion of return on investment. Mm. Today, in a complex world, we need to think of return on investment precisely on the idea of environment, climate, ecology, treatment of human beings, and so on. All that is our way. So, okay, thank you. So I'll be super quick, and I'll just simply say, I really like that Tenzin said, you focus on the individual. So many things that you go to talk about the macro picture. Macro picture is not something most of us can touch, but you can affect yourself and then become a role model. I think uh, if you focus on yourself, um, and that process of transformation, which is a, a lifelong endeavor, I think, that uh, what was the gentleman that created Transcendental Meditation, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, said, uh, uh, before the forest can be green, every tree in the forest must be green. Hmm. So let's all become green trees. <laughs> a brilliant ending. Perfect. Thank you all. Thank you both very much. <laughs>